But uh, bringing this up, we I, I have, a, 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 I think, one of the most important stories. Proud Boys, Black Lives Matter leaders meet to denounce white supremacy. And it looks like we have uh, two Proud Boys as well as a black woman with a Black Lives Matter shirt on. And I'm not entirely sure. It looks like one of the Proud Boys is white, but the other uh, appears to be uh, non-white of some sort. I, I really hate that they've racialized everything. I hate that I have to, to bring it up. I have to talk about it. It really is frustrating and annoying and absurd. But I think it's important to point this story out. This is from 17newsmystateline.com. They say, Salt Lake City, leaders of a local chapter of both Proud Boys and Black Lives Matter met to denounce white supremacy last week after they were mentioned at the first presidential, de presidential debate. The Proud Boys said their safety is threatened when people believe they are white supremacists. Quote, I will go out and say that the Proud Boys as a whole I will say this on behalf of the entire national organization, denounce white supremacy. The chief of the, uh, of the Proud Boys Salt Lake, Utah chapter, who only gave the name Thad, said, Fox 13 reported, we are in no way, shape or form white supremacists. We have a vetting system that gets those people out of our hair. We do not have anything to do with white supremacy. We do not have anything to do with the Ku Klux Klan. We denounce those organizations. Then we have uh, here's, uh, another quote from... They, uh, Proud Boys met with Jakari Kelly, the leader of Black Lives Matter Northern Utah, which is not affiliated with Black Lives Matter Utah, saying, I had no idea who the Proud Boys were. I heard the words Proud Boys mentioned throughout the activist community, and I just didn't know who they were. And then I started to hear they were white supremacists. Kelly met with Thad and Proud Boys chapter president Seth to discuss myths about both groups. We came to realize we had more in common than not. In order to combat evil and racism and hatred in this country, we do need to be able to reach across the aisle and have these tough conversations that everybody is scared to have. Kelly said the Proud Boys she met are not white supremacists and said they were proud American men who needed a little bit of respect and education in order to bridge the gaps. I don't care what color your skin is, we're all Americans, and we need to find a way to come together instead of divide, said Seth. Thad, however, singled out Antifa, which Biden called an idea and not an organization at the debate, saying they are a problem. They are, not a, they are not an idea. They are very much an organization. They are in terrorist cells. That's why they say they are not an organization. They function autonomously in cells, much like terrorists. According to KUTV, Thad said the SPLC and the ADL, along with mainstream media, had created a misconception about the group, blaming violence that has taken place at certain Proud Boys events on provocations by Antifa. They go on to mention, uh, you know, where, where the, the, the Proud Boys were found with Gavin McInnes. And I just want to uh, point out... <laughs> That uh, to hear a, a Black Lives Matter uh, leader saying, I don't know who this group is, I'm going to meet with them, and then saying, no, they just need some education and some respect, but they're proud American men, I think really uh, shows the media is constructing much of the narrative. If you're, if you're going to have a Black Lives Matter leader actually come out and vouch for you guys, I think that's powerful. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, we saw something interesting as Thad calls out Antifa. I think this is important. Just the other day, a Black Lives Matter activist ratted on Antifa. Antifa was planning a flash mob in, I believe it was Portland, and a Black Lives Matter activist said, stop using Black Lives Matter to disguise your activism, and apparently alerted the police, who, as soon as the group formed, within minutes, surrounded them on all sides and arrested every single one of them. So this is Antifa getting arrested essentially because Black Lives Matter tipped them off. I wonder if the real problem in this country is the far left provocateurs and extremists who who are attacking Trump supporters, conservatives who are essentially uh, acting with impunity when these DAs just cut them loose across the country. And we've seen numerous videos where Black Lives Matter activists call them out. There was one where some black women were yelling at some white Antifa women who were spray painting. And then you have these white women saying, oh, no, we're doing it for you. But they're damaging, you know, the black community. I guess I bring all this up because uh, following the story, I'm curious what your thoughts are on Black Lives Matter, especially in context in, in this context and with Antifa. There's some overlap between the riots with Black Lives Matter and, and Antifa as well. So I was I was actually going to make a press release before um, I came on the show last week about this. I haven't spoken about this, and this is actually the first time I'm going to speak about this. But our uh, our Salt Lake chapter was uh, has been in talks right with trying to like make amends with certain groups and um jakari uh met with thad and they had private conversations and they, they uh he called me and he's like hey i'm doing this and this is something that i think is uh important we're not we're clashing a lot but i think we could make amends somehow um 
So after our 26 rally, I actually took some time out of our festivities that night to meet with Jakari. And um, it started out as a very volatile situation where we didn't agree with each other at all, but there was something in common that we had. And before I say that, um, I think the BLM movement, right? The premise that it was started on, on police brutality, I think is something that everybody should vibe with. Yep. I think police brutality is bad, period. Um, it's not something that our group focuses on as much, but we respect that other groups are focused on that. Um, but there is some overlapping things that both groups have, right? Um, two of our tenants, which should be, I, I, I feel like they should be conservative values, but usually they're not portrayed that way, is the closure of private prisons. I was in prison for some time for a white collar crime. I deserved all 10 months of what I got. And another thing is the failed drug war. And we, both groups, at least at that point, we could disagree on everything else. And we do, we do, because it was a very, again, it was a very volatile situation in the beginning, but we got past it. And I've been on the legislative side of things for, for a, a little bit of time. Um, so the first step was getting together and making those amends. And so after that meeting, they met a couple of more times um, and they actually had a press conference that had nothing to do with the debate at all. This was already, this was, this was already planned. And uh, I know that we're, we were gonna catch crap by both sides. We always catch crap from the left, but we knew we were gonna catch crap for, for working with BLM. But it's beyond that. There's something wrong with the judicial system in this country. and. Our guys, I feel strongly that our guys in New York got the short end of the, sh the shaft there. And it's because of that broken system. So our next phase is working together on getting some type of something passed through the legislator on something that we disagree on. And that's, imagine as a legislator, even like a freshman legislator, you got the Proud Boys and BLM walk in and they come together and they want to present something that is either anti-drug war or towards private prisons, uh, something that's pro-liberty. So that's why we met and we feel like bridging that gap is important when needed. And their movement has also been co-opted by anarcho-communists that aren't there for George Floyd, that aren't there for uh, Breonna Taylor, that aren't there for any of those. They're just there to crash this system. They're there, they think, they're role-playing these revolutionaries, and I'm here to tell you right now, those people, Antifa, they're victims. They're victims to a system that has failed them. They're victims to a media that has told them to hate people because of, of their values. To me, white pride groups, right? They're prideful of things. You get me? You ask them, hey, how do you feel about black or brown people? And they're like, well, well, I hate them. You have to ask me, hey, I denounce all those things, but go ahead and ask them to denounce communism and they'll, they embrace it. I mean, they I, love it. I can't get, uh, I've asked some of my staunch, you know, pro Biden friends. I shouldn't say pro Biden, anti Trump is probably a better way to put it. Denounce Antifa. They won't. They literally won't do it. It's the weirdest thing to me. And this, and I think this is a, a big indicator of something, you know, happening in this country. I don't know if Donald Trump's going to win. I think there's a lot of reasons to think he will. The data is completely against him. But there's a group of people in this country, former liberals, politically homeless, who have absolutely no problem saying white supremacy is horrifying, evil, wrong, should be denounced totally, beyond totally, just get rid of all of it. And Antifa is bad, too, because they're violent authoritarians who go around burning down people's buildings. How, why is it so difficult for people on the left who are voting against Trump to denounce Antifa? I don't know. I don't I wish I had a clear answer to that, but they've created this system. They've they've made them their foot soldiers. You get me? Um, I think they've taken so long to do it that even uh, Don Lemon the other day called him out on it because of the polls. He saw the poll numbers and he's like, well, Democrats aren't doing good. These riots. I mean, the two oh, yeah. biggest things that were going on in the country this past year, besides all the craziness that 2020 has brought. <laughs> is COVID and riots, mm -hmm. right? And Democrats, imagine you're a business owner. I'm a, I've been a small business owner my entire life. Um, imagine that you get shut down for three months while Walmart, 
Amazon, all these major corporations are making billions and your little coffee shop gets shut down and you're in the middle of Portland. I I love going back to Portland because it's like the the epicenter of this. And they go ahead and and they shut you down. The city government shuts you down. You have no way of putting food on the table. Uh, Democrats are taking forever to sign like these, uh, these, uh, what's it called? The stimulus things. Um, and then you're finally able to open up. You're in phase two. You're opening up. You're doing Uber Eats. And then here comes Antifa. And they go ahead and they throw a Molotov cocktail through your window and burn down the entire thing. Like, how are you going to feel? You're going to feel like, Ish. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you That's will. One. Uh, That's you're going to feel like you're going to feel like crap because you everything that you've worked for. And they tell me, oh, well, you 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 think of uh property before people that's somebody's sweat and tears that's food on the table for your kids right that's that's your future you're building a future for your family and somebody comes and the government comes and takes it away from you and then this anarcho-communist group takes it away from you and that's why i think trump's gonna win i think trump's gonna win because he's been calling out these shutdowns he's been calling out these riots since day one we've been screaming about it for four and a half years we said it's going to ramp up. We said that they're going to get worse. So here's, here's the important distinction I'll make now with, uh, as it pertains to anti fund Black Lives Matter, the overlap. These extremists, these anar- anarcho-communists, I, wouldn't, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to call them anarcho-communists. I think they're com- authoritarian communists. No. Uh, anarcho-communists are hippies who right. live on a farm, you know, smoke Maybe pot and share some water. Above. anarcho no, it's so confusing. Authoritarian. No, no, they're, no. They're seizing the anarchy. They're taking advantage of it, but I think they do want authority. I think anybody who's willing to use violence to get what they want is an authoritarian who will retain that use of that power because they never feel they won. That's like a, a common theme with these people. They're like, if only I can just win, then I'll make everything right. They use violence, they win, and they say, well, it's, we're not done with the mission yet. We've got to, and so they do these things. But one thing I've said often is that I don't like calling the rioters Antifa because they're flying Black Lives Matter flags. Now, you've mentioned they've co-opted it. Yes. But then they do attract a lot of people who are not communists, who are just racial justice activists, who mm-hmm. fly the flag of Black Lives Matter for Black Lives Matter, but they've been radicalized or brought in by, you know, revolutionary communist types. It's so confusing. Yeah, definitely. It's so confusing. The, uh, the Black Lives Matter and Antifa kind of just escalated together with COVID, yep. the COVID thing. And then everybody started losing their jobs and people went out on the street. First thing they did was like loot buildings and to take things that they couldn't afford. That's not, that's well, not or true. Or things that they have always wanted, like people walking out with sho- boxes of shoes. There, were, there was like one video of someone carrying one shoe. Yeah, it's not well, about it wanting. Was looting. Well, it was looting. It was about well, coming up, making well, money. Yeah, well, they did it in Miami. They hit like the like the highest like mall that they had there and they like pulled out like a whole bunch of like Gucci bags and Jordans and and I don't know how that honors like you're out there for George Floyd and racial justice. I mean, how, how does that even begin to honor the system? And as a matter of fact, they're making it worse. The defund the police thing, they're making it worse. It's like they're training them to, to, to quell protests. Like they're, they're basically, they're giving them free training to do this. And just imagine now here's, here's another thing you could imagine. So imagine you're a Portland police officer. You're sitting there with like a hundred pounds of gear on you, right? you got no days off like today's a riot. So you can't take the day off and your buddies are lined up. And these people, this, this green haired whale is like screaming at you. Right. And, uh, some other dudes like throwing water at you and pointing lasers in your eyes. Mm -hmm. And then your buddy next to you, he gets hit with a Molotov cocktail, which almost happened. He gets hit with a Molotov cocktail. You got to turn off your buddy. The night shifts over. These the the riots have have quelled. I don't know where they go. Um, they probably go under the bridge or something. But these riots have quelled, and then you you're in the locker room, right? You're in the locker room at the police station, and you're taking off all this gear, and your buddy's there. He's burnt all over the place. And what do you think that they just created? They created probably the strongest brotherhood that you could imagine. Like these two guys right here that stood next to each other, like they're gonna they're gonna ride together, you know. Right? What else? And they they're creating this this system that's already there. They're creating this system that's gonna be really volatile if it continues to progress. They're not defunding the police; they're arming them. They're, 
Absolutely. That, that connection is even worse than militarizing police. Well, I think they're uh, arming them is the, is the correct way to phrase it. I've warned about this. So long as the far left keeps going out, smashing windows with impunity, Amer- the American people are going to keep asking for more law and order, more powers for the police, more powers for the federal government. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to get to a point where we have, you know, officer friendly back. We don't want we don't want I don't want cops to feel like they're going to get shot. I don't want them to feel like they need an armored vehicle. But it's gotten to that point because the far left escalates, goes crazy. And so I had had an interesting conversation actually on this show with some of the super chats saying, you know, how would you envision demilitarization? What does that mean? What what weapons do they use are militarized? And I think the issue is just this, uh, you know, as I said, you've got these officers, they wear this full on tactical armor. Often they're, you know, it's camo gear. So it looks like they're in the army. They've got rifles or it looks like they're in some kind of combat situation. They have armored vehicles they ride around on and it doesn't look like officer friendly. And the response I got was, if Antifa is shooting people, if they're throwing Molotovs, if they're throwing bricks and riders are doing this, don't the officers need to protect themselves? And the answer is yes. So then there, it seems like there is no real reasonable way to, you know, demilitarize as many left wing activists say. I still think that we can. Uh, I think we need more funding for police. I think defund is the wrong thing. I think if they want social workers and they want better trained community policing, they need more money. The cops need better pay. The cops need better training. The cops need to feel valued. And what they're doing is the opposite of that. So they're making angry cops. They're, they're making cops demand more protective gear and more, more uh, weapons, they're more techniques. They're making it a team sport. But more importantly, they're ma- uh, it's, it's not, you, you tell the story of these two cops. You know, they come in the locker room, they're taking their gear off. And then the one guy says to the other, I'm like, I saw that woman scream in your face, dude. And he's like, I know. And then they, they kind of chuckle. It's all over. Then they go home to their wives. And their kids. And he sits down on the couch and he's like, oh, what happened at work? Some lady screaming on my face. These Antifa people are crazy. The wife gets angry and she's like, I can't believe they would do this to you. The kids hear it. The kids get mad. They tell their friends. Antifa is spreading hate. You know, these cops are people. They have families. They have friends. They go to the bar. They talk. People hear these things. People care about them. Antifa showing up and doing everything you said, spinning on them, splashing them, being nasty, being awful. It's spreading hatred. Now, I understand there are some bad cops and there's police brutality and these we have laws for that. They go to jail. I do believe that we've got police culture problems because I've personally experienced an officer lying under oath to try and convict falsely convict somebody. Hopefully, uh, um, thankfully, I had footage proving the cop lied. There was no there was no penalty for the cop who lied. So I'm, I, I think we need reforms. I think we need to make sure we get justice when police commit crimes like perjury or literal crimes, murder or otherwise. And I think cops need to be better funded, better trained. And we need, I, I like the idea of some kind of social worker that the, 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 you know, the defund the police people have brought up, but they're going in the wrong direction with it. They're saying defund the police, take that money and hire social workers. And I'm like, but then you have, you know, a vulnerability that social, social worker can't handle every situation a cop can keep the same amount of cops, send a social worker with them for certain situations. And that social worker can deal with cert- certain issues because we, we have seen positive results. But taking money away from the police just makes everything more tense, more dangerous, increases anxiety. You end up in New York where you've got a billion dollars slashed off the NYPD budget, murder skyrocketing, shootings, lethal crime. Yep. So thanks for checking out this clip from the Timcast IRL podcast. We do the show live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. So come back to check us out when we go live. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the like button. Hit the notification bell, and we are also available on all podcast platforms for free if you want to listen to us there. Thanks for hanging out, and we will see you all next time.